everyone and welcome to the online worship service of First Methodist Houston. My name is Andy Nixon. I'm one of the pastors of First Methodist and it's great to have you with us today. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. Our scripture is one of what I call the Old Testament's greatest hits. It is the coat of many colors of Joseph. And it is full of all the things <laughs> that uh, a good drama makes for. There is a lead character who is strong. Uh, he's arrogant. He's bold. He's pretentious. Uh, there's a family dynamic that's highly dysfunctional. There is <laughs> uh, plots and intrigues against him. And then there's a great story of redemption at the end. We will get to all of that. <laughs> but first... Let's put ourselves in a little bit of a, a mindset. I want you to remember a time, okay? Think back. Think back to a time where you were dressed really, really well. I'll give you just a second. But uh, maybe there's a picture on your wall. Maybe there's something that comes to mind. But what was a time where you looked good? And you looked in the mirror, you saw your reflection, or maybe somebody said something to you and said, you know what? You have got it going on. Uh, there's a couple of, <laughs> of instances that I remember. Uh, one is when I was getting, uh, uh, in our family, what you did is you took uh, these uh, high school graduation pictures. And in our family, like maybe others yours, uh, <laughs> we uh, hired a photographer. But one thing my mom did is she took me uh, shopping for clothes. And back in the day, this is, this is going to date me considerably, but there was a time where uh, the shirts with Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola logo uh, written out on, on the shirt was in vogue. And so I had a black Coca-Cola shirt with a Coca-Cola, some black slacks, uh, some, uh, some shoes, and I had my picture taken. When I got the picture, I remember looking at it and saying, wow, am I hot stuff or what? Now, that was not true. <laughs> It was an arrogant filled moment. But if you remember a time like that, it may have been like a, a high school picture. Maybe it was, it was a wedding photo. Uh, maybe it's something you did for corporate life, whatever it is. If you've ever had a moment like that where you look back and say, you know what, boy, uh, I had it going on. That's a Joseph moment in that Joseph has got this coat of many colors and uh, it is high fashion for him. But not only is it high fashion for him, he gets kind of full of himself. And as he does, he alienates himself from his own family, his brothers. To condense the story for our purposes together today, uh, you know, what happens is Joseph has a dream where he uh, dreams that all of his brothers bow down and uh, serve him. And he tells his brothers about this. Well, <laughs> it's, a family, it's a family full of siblings. So what, what do they do? Now, they get jealous, yes, but they beat him up and they throw him in a well. Granted, a little extreme. They sell him to passing travelers. He ends up going to Egypt where he's separated from his family. But then there's a famine and his family has to go to Egypt where they reunite unknowingly with their long lost brother and for the dad's sake, his long lost son. And the story, the scripture we have today is the story of redemption in that Joseph says to his brothers after he's had a chance to feed them, uh, provide for them, all unknowing because they don't recognize him for who he is, although he knows who they are. What he says is this, what you intended for ill, what you intended for harm, God has used for good. And so he takes the story full circle. And even though his brothers did some horrible, horrible things to him, uh, threw him in a well, uh, beat him up, left him for dead, sold him to, in, into slavery, even though all these things happened, he gets to the end of the story where he's reunited with his brothers. And he says, what you intended for ill, God has used for good. So what happens, though, uh, I think for our purposes today is that Joseph makes a change. In his youth, in the early parts of the story, he is an arrogant human being. Uh, he is uh, <laughs> full of himself as far as his chosen status. But over the course of time, he gets humbled. And what he realizes is, even though he was right, okay, even though he knew uh, that God was showing him favor, he was blessed in an extraordinary way, even though that was true, he ends up using his blessing as humility 
so that he can reconcile, forgive his brothers, his family, and they can be reunited, which they are. What does that mean for us today? What does that mean for us as Christians, as followers of Jesus in this Lenten season? Well, Joseph, I think, is a, is a role model for us. And that one of the things Christians have to wrestle with is, to a certain degree, we have a chosen status. Uh, our faith is, is something that is meaningful to us. God speaks to us. Uh, we spend time in prayer. Hopefully we hear the word of the Lord. We read scripture that talks about how uh, we are a priesthood of believers. There are all sorts of things that if we were to look at, look at them in the wrong way, uh, we would use them to elevate our status, to talk about how important we are, uh, to talk about how we are shown favor and blessing. And although those things, I think, are true, the temptation is for us to use those for arrogant purposes. And as I think about just sort of, you know, who I am as a Christian versus somebody who's not, uh, it's real easy for us to get a little bit full of ourselves. And so one of the things I think that's important for us in this Lent season, as we focus on things like self-denial and sacrifice, is to go through this Lenten season, but also use it as a chance to cultivate humility in the sense that it is true. The Lord loves us. It is true that we are blessed. It is true that we're a chosen people, priests and believers, all these things. But what God calls us to do, and Christ sets the example for this, is to use these things with humility. One of the things that Joseph's story teaches us, or it asks the question rather, is, you know, you may be right in the sense that somebody has done you wrong, uh, somebody has done something against you, uh, you have faced uh, trials and obstacles that you did not deserve, uh, that somebody intentionally put in your path. You may be right about all that, but if, if, if we become so full of ourselves, if, if we become arrogant about our own correctness, what that does is it distances us from other people, and I think to some degree from the Lord. It's a humble heart <laughs> that, that God uses and even when we're quote-unquote right, even though maybe somebody has done something wrong to us, uh, we can't let arrogance fuel our faith. The greatest example of this, of course, is Jesus himself. I mean, just think about him for a second. Uh, he is the Son of God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one who went through life and did not sin. If anyone had a license to be arrogant or full of themselves or pompous or to strut in front of others and say, look who I am, a little bit like Joseph did, it's Jesus. But did he do those things? And the answer is, of course, no, he did not. He was somebody who was humble, he was sacrificial, and even when people did him wrong, he found a way for them to be loved by him. And that's what I think Jesus calls us. He set the example for us to do in this Lenten season and in every day, is to make sure that in everything we do, we are humble. Even though God intended it, or people intended it for ill, perhaps, in other words, they tried to harm us, God we'll use it for good. And if we approach every day in every situation like that, I think good things can happen. As I was thinking about this story, I remember a time where uh, I was preparing for uh, uh, an athletic event. I was going to do uh, one of these sort of, uh, oh, what do they call them back in the day? It's like a, well, it's a little like a half marathon. And so I'm, I'm training one day and I'm out for a run. And uh, uh, it's, it's early in the morning. And uh, one of the things that happened is I, I stepped on a, a rock and I ended up rolling uh, my ankle and also tearing uh, my calf muscle. And so, uh, you know, I'm on the ground, hurt, uh, and, and I kind of looked up in the, the startledness of the moment and said, God, why why'd you let this happen? Why, why, why did, you know, I'm preparing for this event, I've been working so hard. You know, why, why all of a sudden did you let this occur? So I limp home uh, for three weeks. I'm doing everything for my ankle I can. Rest, ice, compression, elevation. But for the three weeks that it took to heal and go through all that, I got a chance to appreciate some things that I had missed before. I got to reconnect to some degree with my wife, see her a little bit more, spend time. 
I got to <laughs> visit with my kids more. Uh, and they got a chance to interact with them because I was, uh, for, for certain portions of the day, hobbled uh, on a chair, an ottoman with my foot up. I got to see things that I otherwise would have missed. Even though something ill happened, even though an injury happened, there was, it was able, or over the course of time, uh, I was able to change it, or God working through me changed it, so that good can come from it. Maybe you have had an experience like that. Yes, there was something that painful that, that, that happened. Yes, there was a certain thing uh, that you went through that you suffered. Yes, uh, there were trials and temptations that you faced that should not have had to come your way. Okay, even though those things were there, it's possible for us to go through them and let God use them in a way so that we can see God's goodness in the situation in a way that we did not see them before. This is a little bit of what I think suffering does. As we think about Joseph, there, there's no doubt he suffered. I mean, being beat up by your brothers, being sold into slavery, being left for dead in a well, uh, being raised in a foreign country that is not your home, all sorts of other challenges from people, places, rulers uh, that came his way. There is no doubt that he suffered, but he endured through it. And in going through it and enduring it, his character changed so that when the day came where he was face to face with his family, uh, he could realize the, the redemption story that was about to take place. His family, uh, just to kind of tie a bow on the Genesis story, is uh, they come to Egypt because they're hungry. There's a famine uh, in Israel, and so Joseph's family, where they were originally from, has to come down to Egypt because there's food there. And what's interesting is there's also a, a juxtaposition in the sense that Joseph ends up being abandoned, beaten, left for dead by his family in a state of weakness. But at the end of the story, he's in a position of strength because he is the one who has endured consistent trial. And uh, his family comes and they are needing food, which he, uh, because of his authority in the Egyptian government, has the ability to provide. And so the other side to this is that uh, one of the things I think we can learn from Scripture is that God brings us full circle. Uh, there may be a day where we feel incredibly weak, uh, vulnerable. Uh, we may be hurt or lost. But if we persist through that and if we cling to God through that, what can happen is circumstances change. So that over the course of time, we find ourselves in the opposite position, and then somebody comes to us in need. And the question is, what do we do? Do we lord it over them? Do we take advantage of our increased status and sort of just say, here's who I am and punish the person who's asking for help from us? Or do we have a sympathetic ear and an empathic understanding, and, uh, or an empathetic, I should say, empathetic understanding so that we can identify with the person who is now before us and use what we have for their good. So you see, I think part of what this story teaches us in Lent is how to realize where we are. I don't know what's going on with you today. I don't know the circumstances you find yourself in. Uh, I don't know if, it, if today is a day where you are feeling good and strong because of blessings and, and, and just amazing things uh, that have come your way. Or if you're somebody who's a little bit down, uh, I'm beaten up, I'm lost, uh, I, uh, I, I feel like uh, God's uh, distant from me. I don't know where you are. But the message of Joseph, and I think the message of Lent, is that if we endure, and if we endure faithfully, our circumstances do indeed change. And one day, like Joseph, we will find ourselves in a position to help the person who is in need. On Ash Wednesday, I, I've told a few stories in the last couple of weeks about Ash Wednesday, because Ash Wednesday is a, a powerful day in our church. And we did, at First Methodist Houston, we did curbside dispensation of ashes, where all of a sudden people uh, come by, uh, they lower the windshield of the car, we dispense the ashes, we make a, the cross on their forehead and say, uh, repent and believe uh, in, the in the gospel. Well, time and time again, uh, as we would do this on Ash Wednesday, people would look at me at the, at the end of that moment and say, just thank you so much for doing this. Thank you so much for being here. 
and uh, there was genuine gratitude in their faces and in the emotion of the time. However, uh, one of the things I learned from that is that's our place as the church. You know, we're in a place where we can provide, we're in a place where we can do, we're in a place where we could serve. And it's an honor to be able to be in that place, in that time, and to serve those who are in need. I think that's a little bit of how Joseph felt in his uh, coat of many colors and the whole saga with his family. At the end of the day, he was grateful uh, to be able to serve those in need who were or happened to be his family. You and I, I think, are called to be as followers of Christ, similarly minded in the sense that uh, it's a privilege to serve. And there are people that we can help. There are things that we can do. And when we have the chance to do them, we should take advantage and realize that it's because of the grace and goodness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we are in this position at all. What God intended or what others intended uh, for suffering or ill, whatever may be, God has used for good. And the lesson we can take uh, from the scripture in this Lenten season is that God does this with all things. All things are, are used to serve the Lord for good. And to that promise, we can cling. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We ask that we would use it to guide our understanding of who you are, who we are, and who you are calling us to be. We pray that we would be people with humble hearts and that we would use every moment as an opportunity to serve. Uh, there will be people who cross our paths uh, who have been good to us. There will be people who cross our paths who have hurt us uh, mightily. However, you, can, you use all things and you call us to serve all people at all times with anything that we can do to meet their need. Help us to do this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And as his people, we end our time together by saying the words he taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Great. All right.